Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for February 3rd, 2021. This is the Somerville School Committee update. I am so pleased to be joined today by the new and not so new chair of the Somerville School Committee, Andre Green. Andre also represents Ward 4 on the Somerville School Committee. Andre, they couldn't live without you. This is your second time serving as chair of the Somerville School Committee. Welcome back to Somerville Media Center. Thanks, Joe. I think this time it was more of a, everyone take one step back if they don't the job, and I just didn't hear it, so. <laughs> um, you, but, yeah. you were the lone person standing there, Andre. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's, there is a, uh, there's very much an upside for having you serve again as president because uh, there's no learning curve there. Yes, and uh, I, that, that was actually a large part of it. You know, Carrie put in two years, uh, you know, her second, second and third terms and, you know, gave everything she has and the job is draining and, you know, but yeah, I think being able to step in f from day one has been incredibly helpful because you may have noticed there's a lot going on right now. <laughs> Uh, just a little bit, you know, when they say the plate is full, I think you have a full dinner service in front of you these days. So we're going to get into a little bit more in terms of what the work is that the school committee has planned, uh, what's ongoing. But I want to take a little, a little bit of time, Andre, because there are a lot of people that uh, this is a new audience for you. Um, and why don't you just tell very brief, I know your bio, I know your background. Um, but you're a dad at home these days with a child. Yeah, yeah so um, I am, you know, I'm fortunate to have a job where I can work from home. I work, I do workforce development stuff. I work with the Boston Foundation for my day job. And yeah, I have a first grader at home um, who's doing remote schooling every day. And, you know, you know, so I, I know firsthand this, this is, this is tough, right? Like, you know, the kid doesn't really care. You, you have to work. The kids has to do their school stuff. And like, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's this is a tough time, and we're all juggling, right? And so I have every sympathy in the world for all the other parents who are in the same boat I am, and even more sympathy for the parents who aren't in my boat and aren't blessed to be able to work from home, and you know, bend their schedule around all the other things that are going around. You know, this is a tough time for everybody. And I think it's fair to say that you know I don't think there's anybody I know, Andre, who has not been touched personally by school closing. Right. And it's in an enormous undertaking and it gives all new meaning, not being flipped, but it gives all new meaning to the word homeschooling here. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I think it's also, you know, one of the things that I always come back to is the degree to which society asks schools to do so much, um, you know, it's not just educating our, our, our children. It's not just even the child care perspective component which you know enables so many people to go to work and make a living it's you know the things i think most of us are fortunate to never have to think about right like one of the things that literally keeps me up at night is that since the pandemic has has hit and we've all locked down reports of domestic violence um have plummeted and i don't think anyone thinks no one in their right mind thinks that right now families are feeling less stress and are you know people are being less abused which is that, you know, schools and work, these are places where we catch it, right? And without that, that, that safety valve, I sure to think we're, we're not catching it right now. Yeah, I, I, you know, anecdotally, I did read a report um, concerning the pandemic and the effect it's having on people's mental health. And one of the key components of that is domestic violence is on the increase, but it is not being reported. Right. And the really heartbreaking part of that is whether it's the mom or the dad or whatever caretaker it is that's experiencing the domestic violence, there is a huge hesitancy on their part to depart the family home during the pandemic. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you know, I think we're seeing that play out in any number of ways. I also come back to you know, this is also a massive economic dislocation, right? Like, and, you know, Somerville Public Schools has been and continues to providing food to basically all, all comers as, it sh as we should be. But that's, you know, that is hiding the reality that, you know, in normal times, there are students who, if we don't feed them, they don't eat that day. Um, and, you know, I talk about for a lot actually in my day job, 
COVID hasn't changed who we are. It's just revealed all of the cracks in our system, right? Everything, every papered over crack that we've been ignoring for years, COVID saying you can't ignore it anymore. Yeah, and I, I think another heartbreak, we'll get into the specifics of Somerville public school system, but another heartbreaking part of that report that I was reading and then doing some follow up on is the extent of homelessness amongst the uh, K through 12 education, uh, the kids that are in that system. I've always known that there may have been kids at the Somerville High School or elementary school systems that were technically classified as homeless. But man, is it an eye opener to realize that in this community, there are still families that are homeless. And, and the worst part is, we can't even say concretely how many there are. We know there, there are at least 100 students that we know of who are homeless in some of the public schools. And you know, we factor in homeless instability, people just start reporting. We don't know. Right. Um, and if we didn't know before, we certainly don't know now, right? Um, and, and unfortunately, Andre, because of the economic impact of COVID, we may experience more and more of those kids. I think it's a guarantee. I think, you know, I think the, the worst of the COVID dislocation hasn't happened yet. Um, so I think it's a guarantee. And this is something we, we think about also in terms of our budget, right? Like, you know, so far we have been able to avoid the worst kinds of hits to our budget last year. We are worried and actually we're having our first finance committee meeting for, for the new budget size, uh, cycle tonight. But I think we're, we're legitimately worried as a school district about funding for next year and a year after. Um, the economic re reparations of this are gonna be with, us, be with us for quite some time. And you know, I'm thrilled to hear that you know, Biden's pushing for a state and local assistance in his, in his stimulus bill, because we're gonna need it. We're gonna need yeah. it even to keep standard funding going on, much less the kind of work we're gonna need to do next this summer or next year moving on to make up for this weird year. The long lasting effects of this, I don't think anyone is able to absolutely grasp. But one thing we all know for sure, just because, you know, at some point, hopefully, fingers crossed, Providence intervene here, that we all get vaccinated during 2021, does not mean that the ripple effect of this thing is going to be over. It, it is it's going to not. continue to ripple through our society for at least a few years to come. Right. Um, your perspective on where we are um, in terms of the Somerville Public School System education um, system itself. So where we came from last year out of complete and total virtual learning to um, all of the talks and the presentations that have been given since the fall about reopening of our schools. Sure. So let me start off with, some, with two pieces of what I think are great new great news. Um, one, on Monday, we had, I want to say, four classes of the Capuano of our highest of high need students, the ones who, for whom remote learning simply does not and cannot work for. Um, we started a volunteer program with the, the teachers who we call it group one, these are the highest of high need students. And that program started on Monday. We've had, uh, every day this week, we've had students in the Capuano so you know, young, young kids who really needed it are, are having time with their teacher in a classroom as a volunteer thing, which is great one, because it's fine, we get kids back in the building, that's great, kids who need it. It's also really helping, you know, honestly, it's helping us make sure that our systems are working because our, our, our hope is starting on March 1st, start bringing the rest of group one and then other students back and you know, start bringing students back in. The other piece of good news happened just this morning, um, where we had, we were able to get the first of our educators vaccinated. Um, students, teachers who are social, you know, our educators who are social workers and met those criteria from the state are now as well to be vaccinated and we were able to do nine vaccinations of educators today. And you know, it's, it's, just only, it's only nine to start, but if we're, not, if we're not at the beginning of the end yet, we're starting at the end of the beginning. Andre, quick follow-up question to the first two pieces of good news that you gave. The, the volunteer teachers that are going back into the Capuano, have they been vaccinated? 
Unfortunately, they have not, because I, I don't. I don't believe so. I'm rephrasing. I should. I shouldn't say that. I don't know. Um, and in fact, even if I did know, I'm not sure I can tell you. Um, so I shouldn't say that. I do, do, again, the state, and I could, you know, we're sitting here on, on, on a state's vaccination plan for hours. It's been a disaster. But the state has decided that social workers and those type of emergency uh, professionals, social service professionals, are eligible. Educators are not yet eligible. Now, fortunately, as a district, we have social workers, et cetera. So, we, like I said, we will get some of our people vaccinated. But the, the state has not yet authorized us to start vaccinating teachers, to my great annoyance. And that's because these social workers are considered frontline. Uh, yes, and, line I, and, I, and, and you know, I, I actually sent an email to the governor's office to, yesterday asking because I don't understand what, you know, and, and to be clear, I have nothing but there's all the respect in the world for social workers. And I think they should be being vaccinated now and they should be being priority. But I don't get what they're doing that teachers aren't. So it's, I don't see why they're getting vaccinated and teachers aren't getting vaccinated. I think they should both be getting vaccinated right now. Well, speaking of, we can address the issue of vaccination for the, you know, the teachers, but it's interesting that for our highest need students in this kind of pilot program going back, that we had to do it on a volunteer basis. What was the, what, what is the part of it that the public might be missing about why these teachers had to be volunteer? Well, so I think it's a couple of things. One is we're still finalizing the building situation. Um, we hope to start getting, getting, getting builders back under control as this month as this month progresses. And the second part is we're still, you know, we're still finalizing hopefully an agreement with the SEU. Um, the teachers since, union here yes, in the city. City. Yes, they, they've, they've recently, recently renamed themselves the Summer of Educators Union, so SEU. Um, and, you know, it is our strong preference to, you know, come to an agreement before we have student teachers made it, made it to return. Um, so, while the is still on, ongoing, they've agreed to agree with us to on this pilot program, which also, again, I think gives us an advantage that now we have actual classrooms of students who we think, you know, for very simple reasons, you know, both definitely need to be back and, and it's sometimes the, the hardest ones to bring back. So I think it helps everyone moving forward to know that the system works. Terrific news. Terrific I'm, news. I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I like. Again, if it weren't for the fact that these are our most fragile students, and if I have no business going, I really wish I could see it. Yeah, but. yeah, I think you know it's a. I hate to use that age-old adage of light at the end of the tunnel, right. but even though it's a baby step, it's a step. We're we're not frozen in place. So, right. all my best wishes to the teachers who volunteered. Kudos to them and um, bravo to them. I want, I, you know, and I, and I, I want to give you know, SCU credit. They recognize, as, as I think everyone recognizes, that it, you know, in a vacuum, no one disagrees that students are better served with in-person instruction than they are remotely, right? I think some, I've said before, and I'll say it again. I think some will probably, you know, develop the most robust remote learning pro program of any district in the state. But if we thought remote learning was the was a substitute for in-person learning, we'd have we'd have already moved to it, right? Um, so I, you know, I think people, and it's not just SEU, it's not just, I think everyone may just have opinions as to what is safe enough and how the right way to, way to bring students back safely is. But I think everyone agrees that to the extent that we can do it safely, students are better off with in-person learning if we can make me safe. Yeah, I don't, you, Andre, you know, my background is I have many, many um, nieces and nephews, grand nieces and nephews, um, everything from, um, you know, pre-K all the way up to college. So I, I understand what the ramifications are of keeping everybody out of school. I understand that. But there are some major issues in order to get back there. We have some major issues. Sure. We have the issues of the unions representing the, the educators system. We have the issue of the city of Somerville actually owning the physical asset, um, which is the mayor has control over those buildings and whether or not we have enough money to pump into them to make them safe through air filtration systems and HVAC and everything else. We also have your Somerville School Committee who has a charge to do the right thing by the education system. And we have the superintendent 
who not only oversees the whole system, but has administrative staff, has budgetary constraints, right. has responsibility for um, adhering to state guidelines. Pulling all of those disparate pe people together and putting them at a table and trying to get agreement, um, I think you're absolutely right that no one disputes that the goal is to try to get the kids back to school. Right. Here's another conundrum that we've got, and I know you're fully aware of it. In order to get all of our educators and support staff back into the school system, a lot of people would feel a whole lot better that if we could say 90% of them have received the vaccine. Yeah, including myself, frankly. And, um, I just, you know, I, I, I think it is hard to overstate how much, how little a part of the state has been in, in, in all of this. Um, from from last summer when they were proposing plans where it was clear that their priority was not the safety of students and school, uh, safe, the safety of student staff, but of getting people back to normal so that, that people could get back to work and, and employees get their employees back to their disastrous vaccine rollout, both in terms of logistics of it, you know, Summerville's getting 100 cases a week, 100 vaccines a week to, get, to distribute. Um, to even like the ideological decisions to not prioritize teachers, right? Um, at no point in the process can I say that Desi or, or the governor has been an ally to the people to the people of Somerville and trying to, you know, handle this. To the point to you know, and, and that's the other thing is like the seals reopening. Like if we're truly trying to figure out what's best for our people, is 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 having the casino open really helping anybody get schools open? No, of course not. Right. But we made the calculation. I, I, I think Baker made two calculations. Um, one is that he didn't have the money to pay things to stay closed, and he wasn't. And God forbid he was going to raise taxes, so that's not an option. And barring that, he made the calculation, and I, you know, don't know. I can say he's wrong politically. He's absolutely wrong morally. But I don't think that's why he's wrong politically that desire for privileged people, primarily in the suburbs, for whom at this point COVID is kind of an abstraction because it doesn't affect them. And if they do get it, they don't die from it. Making, helping them feel like they can return into normal was worth whatever it costs in terms of, you know, black and brown people and, and urban residents and elders, you know. Frankly, he calculated that uh, their lives aren't, their lives aren't, aren't wor are worth less than the convenience of the people who are mad and want things to reopen. You, Andre, you, you and I have been friends for a while, so but I, I don't want to get into that, you know, political discussion that you and I have behind the scenes. But do you do you think that Baker Baker's decisions have been um, prompted by his his ignorance of those facts, or because he's looking at it from a very high level viewpoint, he's doing it um, in a macro kind of based on the entire yeah, yeah. state. I think he did a cost-benefit analysis, and cost-benefit analysis. Tim said that normalcy, normalcy in Newton is more important than safety in Chelsea. I think he did. He, you know, he's a bean counter. I think that's what he did. He counted the beans and he made the cold decision that, yeah, I get it. That's going to make life harder in Revere and Chelsea and Cambridge and Somerville. But a, they don't vote for me anyway. Yeah. And b. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's a fact that we can't ignore. Those of us who are political animals understand sometimes how decisions are made and they're made by um, the scales, right? The scales, which way do the scales go on this thing? Um, Again, I think morally his decision is, is abhorrent and you know, he should be, he, he should be voted out of office in, 20, in 22. But like, you know, if you listen to you see his poll, his, his his poll numbers, they're still sky high, even as he's been a disaster with the vaccine rollout. So it's hard to say that he's making the wrong call politically. Well, I'm sure there's many sectors of Massachusetts who are not going to forget how he was making decisions. But I, I want to get not, into not to let them. I, I want to get into how the new administration, Washington, the Biden administration, is making decisions that will affect how Baker will make decisions which will affect how Joe Curtitoni is gonna make decisions, which is gonna affect how the Somerville School Committee will make decisions. God, I hope so. <laughs> it's a downhill, it's a downhill, uphill kind of fight. And we're gonna see who meets in the middle here. 
But you mentioned something earlier that I had talked to you, Councillor McLaughlin, when he was on the show earlier today about the lack of vaccine to actually administer to our residents. So I, I wanna kind of jump ahead and I wanna assume that the union is negotiating in good faith. The school committee superintendent are all at the table helping make decisions. The mayor understands his duty and responsibility when it comes to the physical school system, school schools itself, make them safe, upgrade them. The, the one question I want to ask, though, and, and I didn't want to ask Councillor McLaughlin because I understand his constraints, too. We're only getting approximately 100 vaccines a week. How are we going to implement if and when there is an approved safe vaccine for kids. How do we do that? I wish I had, I wish I knew what the answer was right now. I think that's, that's, you know, I, I hope that Doug Cress is, you know, is losing sleep trying to figure that out. Um, and I think, well, I think the good news is between our testing, our, our testing regimen and the schools, we will have practice, practice with the infrastructure um, so if, assuming we get them, I think we'll be able to deliver them through schools. Um, Throws me yeah. back to the old days. I, I don't know about you, Andre. I know I'm probably two years older than you are, but it throws me back if to that. the old, if that, it throws me back to when, as a kid going through school here in Somerville, we had vaccination days, right? right? It, so it was all administered in the gym and then we would have a half hour rest time so we could be observed. Do you envision something like that happening in Somerville if we get there? So, you know, assuming that there is a vaccine that's proof for children, I would, I would be hard pressed to imagine we won't, we won't mandate it for our, for our students. Um, we haven't yet because there's, a, there's no one on the horizon yet, but right. if you know, the news this week is true that they think they'll have one by the summer, then I think I would, you know, without you know speaking to my colleagues on something that i haven't deliberated for i can't imagine we wouldn't do it and again i think with, with the testing which is going remarkably well as you know we for, between community schools and now the, the volunteer pilot program we're doing the testing well i think we'll have the infrastructure to yes that's the case like i think when we were when we were looking at mandating the flu vaccine the plan was you know obviously go get it elsewhere if you can but if you can't we were going to have flu clinics in, in the schools. I can't imagine we would do differently for COVID. Yeah, great. I want to ask another question, and, and we're going to, yeah, Andre, you know me. You and I can sit there on the floor of the VNA and Conwell Street and talk forever, but I wanted to ask one more question, and it has to do with the great digital divide. I know from working with other not for profits in, in the city that we still have a problem. And the problem is that those who are less affluent, primarily in the person of color households, may not have capable internet connectivity. They may not have top of the line laptops that their kid can use. Where are we going and what have we done to- So, you know, Sorbo, you know, you know the Sorbo Public Schools issued a Chromebook to every student in the, in the district. We have put up uh, hotspots in, you know, in public housing. We've worked with individual families to get them internet connection. We're subsidizing that cost. Um, so you know, I think we are doing everything we can to, provide, to make sure that all of our all Somerville Public School students have devices and have internet access. Um, it is, you know, I don't think I'm hiding anything people don't know. It is a stock solution, right? Like we as a society, and I think, you know, we as a society, as a country is really large, and you know, sort of has this role play, everyone's role, play. but we have to acknowledge that in, in 2021, the internet is a utility, is a basic utility, right? Um, it's like electricity in your exactly, home. Exactly, right? Like, you know, no one says, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe you should just go without water this month. No, these are basic utilities at this point, right? And if it's a basic utility, we, we have to treat it as such, right? And I think we, we haven't made that step yet as a society and we need to, that, yeah. You know, I, I say this all the time. In 2021, is no such thing as being tech illiterate. If you're tech illiterate, you're just illiterate. In the same way, if you're enumerate, you're illiterate, right? Like, we have to accept that this is just part of the, the basic infrastructure of being a fully connected citizen. And that's the case. We need to act like it. And we need to 
fund it publicly when possibly and all, all those things that we would do for anyone, any other basic need. Yeah, I certainly think the federal government and the state governments and the municipalities, if they were to look at um, connectivity to the outside world, meaning through <laughs> internet, uh, Wi-Fi, it would be a basic right because you cannot occupy a home that doesn't have functioning plumbing. Right. You cannot occupy a home that doesn't have functioning electricity. Right. I, I would say you can't occupy and be connected to the world without outside connections through Wi-Fi right. and cable. I, 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 would, I think it's. I think some of those should relook at, you know, um, municipal Wi-Fi. I think we need to really be thinking about what does it mean to provide indefinite, you know, sustainable universal access to the internet. And well, I, you're no, not going to no get. Ideas on the you're not going to get any disagreement from the Somerville Media Center on that one. I mean, we we work with you know Comcast and RCN and the city through our franchise agreement. Um, we serve a segment of the population um, in this city that cannot afford their own connectivity, right. that cannot afford their own camera equipment or laptops or the latest iPad or iPhone. Or and, and we see the need. We know that need is out there. So. From our standpoint, we don't want to get put out of business, but I would love to be able to see everybody do their own shows from home. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think you'd, I don't think you'd, you'd be put out of business. Be a whole, whole new revenue stream for you. Yeah, we do. We do. We've realized that in the last eleven months. Um, Andre, anything you want to wrap up with? We've got about forty-five seconds left here. I, you know, I just I want to. Besides, I think things are looking good. I think we're at, you know the end of the beginning, and I look forward to seeing students back in the buildings. Hopefully, soon as next month. Excellent. Two great pieces of news from Andre Green on today's show. Um, as with the city council, we're going to be doing these twice a month. So we look forward to having Andre back and maybe some of his colleagues. Andre, thank you so much for making the time today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great. For the Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you in a couple of weeks with the Somerville School Committee update.